Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's event on food labeling for healthier choices, where we're going to be asking the question whether the existing Nutri-Score label for food should be implemented EU-wide. My name is Dave Keating. I'm a journalist based in Brussels, and I'm going to be guiding us through today's conversation. Now, there's some important context to take into account when we're talking about this subject. Uh, one is that the European Union has committed, as part of its Farm to Fork strategy launched earlier this year, to coming forward by the end of 2022 with a proposal for a mandatory EU-wide front-of-pack nutrition label. But because there are several nutrition labels out there, there is a fierce debate about which labeling scheme should be used. In today's event, we're going to be talking about one of these labels, Nutriscore, which has been popular in some countries like France and less popular in other countries like Italy. Now, at the moment, Nutriscore seems to be the labeling scheme most endorsed by most member states, and it's been endorsed by the European Consumers Association, Bayuk, which is hosting today's event. But it doesn't yet have universal support. The other context that this debate's coming in is a growing obesity problem in Europe. One in two European adults and one in three children are already overweight or obese. Non-communicable diseases such as heart disease, stroke, cancer, chronic respiratory diseases, and diabetes are the leading cause of mortality in the world, and unhealthy diets are one of the main causes. And in this context, we also have to consider the COVID-19 pandemic. The link between obesity and complications from the virus are becoming increasingly evident. So informing consumers about the nutritional content of the food they're eating is becoming more and more important. Yet at the moment, nutritional information can be very difficult for the average consumer to understand. EU law currently only requires a nutritional information label on the back of packaging in tiny font. It details the amount of seven key nutrients, such as sugar, saturated fat, and salt, per 100 grams. But the question is, how is an average consumer meant to know that 8% saturated fat is high, while 8% sugar may be low? What would be different about the Nutri-Score label compared to the EU's current requirements? Well, for starters, it would be on the front of the package, not on the back. And rather than just giving the content of certain nutrients, it converts the nutritional value into a simple overall score based on a scale of five colors and letters. The method of calculation for that score is the subject of some debate. Uh, but it takes into account both the nutrients to limit, such as calories, saturated fat, and sugars, and those elements to favor, like fiber, proteins, nuts, fruits, and vegetables. Of course, we know that front-of-pack labeling won't be a silver bullet to solve all our health problems, but it's certainly one tool that can help consumers make healthier choices in the supermarket. But if we're going to require standardized EU labels, then there's some important questions to answer, like should a label be mandatory or voluntary? Should it use colors? Should it give an overall score or information on individual nutrients? And of course, the subject of today's debate, which label do consumers understand the best? Uh, so this is what we're going to be talking about today. And I'm going to run through a little bit of the housekeeping. You guys are going to be able to ask your questions using the Q&A feature on Vimeo. Go ahead and type those questions in there. And I'm going to be reading out them out at the end. Please only ask questions rather than making statements in that tool. Uh, also, there's going to be a Bayuk representative there in the Q&A who may answer you via text uh, by some, uh, some of the more technical questions. Uh, and this event, just as an obvious reminder, it will be recorded. Uh, now, when you ask your questions, please identify your names and your organization if that isn't already displayed in your username. Okay, enough from me. Let's hear from our experts who we've assembled here today on this thorny topic. I'd like to first turn over the floor to Bayuk Director General Monique Goyens for some introductory remarks. Monique? Yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, there is. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Dave, for giving me the floor. And uh, on behalf of Berg, I would really like uh, to welcome you to this second event in a series that we call Consumer Debate. And I really think that Nutri-Score is up for a debate because we know it's a hot topic. 
and we would really like uh, that this event would really uh, contribute to have a constructive contribution towards what's coming up now at EU European level uh, in uh, the preparation of policy making when it comes to nutrition labeling. Uh, Berg has been working very hard uh, in advocating since many, many years now for a mandatory EU-wide nutrition label with a color code. Because as you said, Dave, uh, it is really important to support consumers in making, if they want so, in making healthy choices on the spot in the, in the supermarket without needing a PhD in order to understand what is in fact the, the nutrition information on the back of the pack. Uh, and we have identified together with our members that Nutri-Score is, um, is the best option. We believe that this is the, 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 the labeling scheme that can best help consumers making those um, uh, healthy choices, the, easier, the easiest ones. But we also know that Nutri-Score is not a panacea to address all diet-related issues when, uh, for the population in general. But we also are aware that no label can be the panacea. There are limitations for all of those labels. We also are aware that uh, health authorities recommend to um, prioritize fresh and minimally processed food. But as a consumer organization, we also go back to reality and to market and look at how people eat. And the reality is that people, consumers, very often choose uh, processed food, transformed food. And there is where NutriScore can certainly be very helpful in making choices between the healthier and the less healthy options. And that is why today our members will now, in a few minutes, uh, share their experience and share their analysis on why they believe that Nutri-Score is the best option. Of course, various options are on the table. And today, uh, the, the objective of this event is really to explain Nutri-Score, what it is and what it is not, how it works, and why some of the operators, be it consumer organizations, be it retailers, be it producers, believe, be it academics, believe that um, Nutri-Score is the best option available uh, for consumer uh, informed healthy choice. As you said, Dave, all participants, please, you are welcome to post your comments uh, according to the instructions that have just been given. And we will try to, um, to, answer, to address them, or at least we will take them into account uh, in the follow-up of this work. And what we really hope today is to deliver an insightful conversation that will uh, inform uh, the EU policymakers in what is going to become a very, very topical and priority topic in the months to come. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Monique, for that introduction. Uh, so now we're first going to really hear the nitty gritty about what Nutriscore is. I'd like to introduce Professor Mike Rayner. He's from the University of Oxford, and he's going to give us a presentation about how Nutriscore works. Mike? Thank you. So Bauk asked me just to talk about what is Nutriscore um, in seven minutes, so I'll try and do that. So could I have my next slide, please? And, and my next slide. Could I have my next slide? So just to declare my interests here, um, the group I work for doesn't accept funding from uh, food manufacturers or retailers. And also I've been closely involved in the development of the UK Food Standards Agency, Ofcom, Nutrient Profiling Model, and that model um, was the basis for the Nutri-Score algorithm. Next slide, please. So just today, I'd like to talk briefly about a, a system for looking at front of pack food labeling, um, then give you a little bit of history about food, front of pack food labeling in Europe, um, tell you why I now prefer Nutri-Score to the traffic light labeling system which we use in, in the UK and which uh, I previously favored. Uh, just a little about taking on some attacks on Nutri-Score because Nutri-Score, as we already heard, isn't favored by everyone. And finally, uh, to think more about environmental impact labeling as well as nutrient labeling because I think that's on the horizon. So next slide, please. So basically, I think there are six types of front of pack um, food, re health related food labeling. Two forms of true front of pack nutrition labeling um, 
nutrient specific systems, which highlight the individual levels of nutrients in food. And the, the famous system here is the traffic light system in the UK. But recently we have got these new summary indicator systems, which give you an overall score, if you like, for the healthiness of foods. And a nutrient score is probably the most important one of those. And that's the one we're talking about today. So next slide, please. But there are also other systems for front to back uh, nutrition labeling, dividing into claims and warnings. Some nutrient specific systems like the whole grain symbol, some summary indicator systems like the green keyhole from uh, Norway and Sweden, um, some new style nutrient specific warning systems such as the Chilean system, and then you could, in theory, have summary indicator systems for warnings. I, um, at one point, argue for skulls and crossbones on foods to give an indication of which foods should be avoided. So next slide, please. But really, only three of these types of systems are current in Europe at the moment. Um, in fact, there's been a rapid development of front to back labeling across um, Europe in 2017, only a few countries had any sort of front to pack labeling. And next slide, please. By 2020, um, we got many more countries with uh, front to pack nutrition labeling, in particular, of course, Nutriscore is spreading around the uh, Western part of Europe. Next slide, please. So what is Nutriscore? That's the title of my talk. Um, well, here it's summarized on a single page. It's an algorithm and a form of expression of that algorithm. The algorithm is based on seven components, as we've heard already, no, perhaps we haven't heard already, energy, saturated fat, sugar, and, and salt, plus um, protein, fiber, fruit and vegetable, and nut content. And basically, um, you score points for these nutrients, and on the basis of that, that those points, uh, you get an, a score from A to E. A being a good food and E being a bad food. Next slide, please. The important thing, as um, our uh, uh, facilitator said um, at the beginning, is really which is the best system um, for, for Europe or for any country in Europe. And I think we need to know two things about a system, whether it really has um, a relationship with health. So is it giving um, information which is really about healthy, healthy diets? And that's really part the, that's the responsibility of the underlying algorithm. And then on the other side, we need to know whether the actual graphical design of the, of the, of the, for, of the labeling has an impact on health. And this gives you, this slide gives you a, a general scheme for looking at the research into a, a front of back labeling system, which should tell you whether it's best or is, is, is the best. So next slide, please. So in particular, NutriScore has, ha, there are lots of studies now which show clearly that the underlying algorithm has a relationship with health of consumers. So the more healthy foods you consume under the, uh, as labeled by the scheme, the more healthy you're going to be at the end of the day, less heart disease, less cancer, longer lives. And similarly, we also know from a series of studies that uh, the graphical design works as well. Color coding is an important determinant, is important feature of, of the graphical design and that ha ha has now been shown to be useful in purchasing decisions. So just two studies that I'd like to show you about Nutriscore in that regard. So first slide, please. In terms of the prospective association, association with health, I think we can be clear now that um, people who eat, as I said just earlier, people who eat lots of foods which are in the, the A category um, have a lower health in terms of cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease, obesity, and metabolic, uh, metabolic syndrome. Next slide, please. And also we can now have got really good studies showing the impact of the labeling scheme in actual real life supermarkets in purchase, purchasing situations. So next slide, please. So here is the famous French study done by the, commissioned by the French government, which looked at the different forms of labeling in 60 supermarkets around the country. Next slide, please. And showed that Nutriscore 
improved, helped improve the, the healthiness of the shopping cart of people using that labeling scheme compared with the other forms of labeling in the study, traffic lights and, and another form of labeling. So I think we have really got very good evidence now that this actually helps us in purchasing decisions to make healthier food choices. So next slide, please. Just turning briefly to some attacks upon Nutri-Score. I think there are three sorts of attacks, really. One is that it doesn't take account of all the important nutrients in the diet, particularly um, things like um, artificial sweeteners. And that is true, but also it doesn't take account of things like trans fatty acids and so forth. And the reason why it doesn't is it's it aims to be simple, to score the healthiness of the foods on, on just seven components. And that makes it simple, but also uh, open to uh, some attack from nutritionists who would like lots of things to be considered. The second attack recently, I think, has been in relationship to um, it, the fact that it doesn't seem to take account of processing of foods. We know from a lot of studies now that processing, processed foods are unhealthy and the uh, good studies showing a relationship between the consumption of ultra processed foods as defined by the NOVA system from, from Brazil and, and health. Uh, and the more you, you consume of the ultra processed foods, the more, more unhealthy you are. But nevertheless, this slide shows that most um, ultra processed foods, foods are labeled by Nutri-Score in the E and the D and the C category, 79% in fact, and very few of the ultra processed foods figure in the A and the B, food, B categories. And that's just a, a function of the system. It can, um, Nutri-Score at the moment doesn't take account of the ultra processing of foods. And the third criticism, I think, is that it doesn't take enough account of environmental sustainability. Next slide, please. And I think around Europe, we're beginning to think of, of, of ways by which we can label the environmental impact of foods. We now know that a lot of animal products in the diet are very bad for both health and more importantly, for the environment. And there are forms of um, environmental labeling which are being tested as we speak similar to traffic light labeling that they separate the components of the uh, of environmental impact in, in this instance in case of water scarcity climate change um, biodiversity and water pollution and others which are summary indicator systems which give you an environmental impact score for the foods so these two labels on the right are being tested in my research group as we speak to see if they have an impact on people's food choices as well as things like Nutri-Score and traffic lights on the left. So just to summarize my next slide, please. Um, obviously front to back nutrition labeling systems have different aims, for example, to distinguish between different levels of nutrients and an overall score for the food. New score aims to give an overall summary of the healthiness of a, of a food as quick and simple and easy to understand. The nutrient profiling model for NutriScore is better validated than for any other front to pack labeling system. The graphical design for NutriScore has now been shown to be effective in numerous studies. But finally, I think, and I do think we should have NutriScore made compulsory across Europe. We need to review it regularly in order to um, change it and develop it in the light of, of scientific knowledge and the food markets. So thank you very much for um, having me today. Thanks very much uh, for that presentation. Now, just a reminder, you guys can ask your questions to Mike in the Q&A feature just to the right of your screen. Uh, remember to, when you're asking your question, identify your name and the name of your organization. And we'll either read your question here in the video or someone will write back to you within uh, uh, from Bayuk in the chat. So let's move on to our uh, panel now of consumer organizations to hear what consumer organizations and consumer experts think about uh, the NutraScore system. After that, we're gonna be able to ask them some questions along with questions uh, for Mike. So let's start with Olivier, Olivier Andreau. He's from UFC Cachoisier, and he's going to give us his perspective on the NutraScore system. Olivier? Uh, hello. Uh, thank you uh, for giving me the floor. Could you uh, please um, uh, put my presentation on the screen, Dave? Great, thank you. Uh, and if you 
just begin. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So uh, I, I try to um, make a short presentation about the situation in France that led the uh, official uh, health authorities to choose Nutriscore in uh, 2017. Um, we have in France um, um, official nutritional recommendation, which is the Programme National Nutrition Santé, National uh, Nutrition Programme. And the uh, main aspect and main recommendation to the French consumer, uh, you can just uh, yeah, keep on the first slide, thank you. And I want to, um, I mean, to insist on the fact that the first uh, very important recommendation of the uh, French nutritional program to the consumers is to eat more raw products, uh, fruit, fresh fruit and vegetables, uh, meat, fish, and to cook at home. But as Monique has already said, uh, I mean, the reality is very different from these recommendations. And um, we have a problem for consumers because the French, uh, French consumers, of course, do know very well the nutritional quality of raw products, but they don't have a clue about the nutritional quality of processed food. Next slide, please. Okay, I go very rapidly uh, on what's going on uh, from the uh, regulation point of view in Europe. We have the ANCO nutritional labeling, which is compulsory now, and you've got the um, simpler uh, uh, version uh, on the uh, uh, left side of the slide. So you see that it's already a bit complicated and you have the most complicated version uh, that you would find very often, for instance, of breakfast cereals, which is on the uh, right side of the slide. And um, it's not a surprise that very few consumers in France uh, actually understand this labeling because it's uh, far too complicated. Uh, we, we've got several um, polls that were made and that show that around 80% of the French consumers simply do not understand that ankle labeling. So uh, what sort of uh, simplified lab labelings did we have in 2016? Next slide, please. So in France, we had at least these four different labelings, uh, which uh, were very, still very difficult to understand for the consumers and apart from the Carrefour version, probably. But you see that um, it's impossible for a consumer to make a comparison from one system to another. So this is the reason why the uh, French national authorities um, put in place this uh, very famous um, studies in 2016. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, and we consumer organization, we were asked to define what we were awaiting from uh, a successful simplified labeling. We wanted to be um, understandable at a glance. We wanted it to, uh, um, uh, to, to be easy uh, for the consumer to make a comparison with products belonging to the same category of food or belonging to a different category. This is a very important aspect because for instance, for breakfast, you can eat, for instance, uh, butter and bread with jam. You can eat uh, croissant. You can eat breakfast cereals. You can eat breakfast biscuits. And you see that all these uh, specific products belong to very different uh, food categories. And uh, although they can be eaten at the same time uh, of, the, um, of the day. So it's very important for the consumer to be able to compare the uh, specific nutritional quality of these different foods. And we also wanted it to be based on a hundred grams uh, analysis because um, the uh, nutritional quality of the food uh, um, shouldn't be depending and, and the nutritional assessment uh, by the consumer of a, of a food shouldn't be based on the portion size, because um, if you take a very tiny portion size, this can be uh, very um, tricky for a consumer to assess the real nutritional quality of the food. It should be, of course, present on all food products in order um, that, uh, so that the French consumer can uh, compare all products. And of course, it has to be scientifically proven. And for the manufacturers, it had to be easy and inexpensive. And as Mike Ryan has already said, 
this is the reason why it was had to be based mainly on the information given by uh, anchor labeling. It has to be transparent and also scientifically proven. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. So uh, I will go very rapidly concerning the French methodology because Mike Ryan has already uh, talked about it. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so we had two studies actually. One big study on sexy supermarkets, uh, which um, showed that all college systems improve the uh, nutritional score of the food bought by the consumers, but nutrition score is the most efficient. And especially for low income consumers, this is a very important news for us. And uh, interesting also, um, when nutrition score is present on one food, it has also an impact on the uh, food product, which is next to it, even if it doesn't have any labeling. And there was also a qualitative study which was made on 2,400 consumers, and it showed that concerning the synthetic models, all the synthetic models uh, that Mike Reiner called um, summary or summary labeling, these uh, models are the most visible, the most understandable, and they help best to classify food products. And among these synthetic models, Nutri-Score by far is the mo most efficient. And concerning the analytical models, these are uh, models that give the information of, of the low or high content of uh, different nutrients. Um, of course, consumers like to have more information. And in some cases, we can say that they prefer these analytical models, but they do not help to classify food products, which is the most important thing that a consumer has to do when he chooses a food product. And uh, it even has some negative impact on low income consumers. Next slide, please. Okay, next slide. I, these are just examples of the um, nutrients that are on uh, typical uh, French food products. Next slide, please. Um, this is interesting, as I said, this is, these are several uh, examples of food products that can be eaten for breakfast. And you see that uh, you've got a whole range of different products that are available for breakfast, uh, ranging from Nutri-Score A to Nutri-Score E. And you see that all these foods belong to a very different uh, family of food products. Next slide, please. Um, the uh, very last poll that was published on the consumers on the French consumers' perception of Nutri-Score uh, says that 95% of consumers have already seen the Nutri-Score logo on food products, although it's not compulsory in France because there is uh, this hindrance uh, from the uh, EU legislation. We uh, assess that Nutri-Score is present on uh, about a third of the uh, French food, pro uh, food products presently. 81% of the French consumers know the name Nutri-Score, 71% that a Nutri-Score A or B will comfort them that when they choose a food product, and three quarters of French uh, consumers want Nutri-Score to be present on all food products. So it means that we do have to uh, make the uh, EU legislation more to allow Nutri-Score to be compulsory on food products. Next slide, please. Um, okay, till now, um, I've talked about the, uh, uh, the advantages of Nutri-Score for the consumers. It makes the, uh, the choice easy, but uh, it also has some advantages for the food manufacturers. This is an example of the evolution of the nutritional quality of breakfast cereals. Um, you see the oat meals, uh, which is a, a staple of uh, uh, of food for, uh, for, uh, for millenniums, uh, which is Nutri-Score A, so very good uh, nutritional quality. Then in the 1960s on French food markets came the uh, American breakfast cereals that were Nutri-Score B. And then in the 1980s, we had these uh, chocolate breakfast cereals that were Nutri-Score C. And now we even have some tranchy muesli, which is Nutri-Score D. So you see that 
in uh, a little more than half of a century, uh, of a century we had um, a, the nutritional quality of uh, breakfast cereals that uh, evolved from A, very good nutrition quality, to D, which is a problem. Why? Because it's so simple to use uh, sugar, chocolate, fat, in order to uh, make uh, the, the food feel better uh, for the consumers. But the uh, health uh, impacts of these politics policies is uh, very damaging to the health of the consumer. Next slide, please. Um, and why was it so difficult for uh, the uh, food industry to make better recipes? Well, because uh, first of all, consumers wouldn't see this. A change on inco labeling won't be seen because nobody reads it. And consumer cannot compare standard and modified food because they don't understand this uh, very complicated anchor labeling. And uh, you would say that, uh, well, you have nutrition claims, but uh, with that nutrient profile, reduction claims can be misleading if the global nutrition quality of food is not taken into account. You can lower, for instance, the percentage of sugar and have afterwards uh, a bigger percentage of fat, for instance. And for manufacturers, big changes are needed for reduction claims. So it's quite difficult to obtain uh, um, a reduction claim. And lowering the level of sugar, fat, salt is costly and could jeopardize consumers' acceptance. Next slide. But with Nutri-Score, I mean, this is a, a big incentive for better recipes because a change of color will be seen immediately by the consumers. And consumers will easily compare with non-modified food products. And it's also important to know that the color is calculated through a global assessment of the food, not just one nutrient. So you, you, won't, you won't have any more of that problem of lowering the food, the, the sugar content and having a bigger amount of fat. Last slide, please. And I've got a good news for you because since the introduction of Nutri-Score in France, uh, all the, almost all breakfast cereals were Nutri-Score C or D. And we didn't have any breakfast cereal, which was, uh, I mean, children, uh, intended for children, which was Nutri-Score A or D. And now we do have a big um, international brands that issue very recently, um, examples of uh, breakfast cereals with Nutri-Score B. Um, you have those examples from Nestle, Cheerios, and Chipotle. And you even have one example of Nutri-Score, which is A, which is very good. Thank you. Thanks very much, Olivier. It's interesting to see the, the market player response to the label in France. Let's next turn to Nelika Polderman, she's from uh, Con Consumenten Bond in the Netherlands, which is set to endorse Nutriscore next year, but is doing so with some reservations. Nelika, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yes, let me uh, update you on the situation in the Netherlands. Um, what uh, we've done as a consumer organization, we've been following uh, all the developments in other countries, and especially we were looking to the situation in France that uh, Olivier has just informed us about. And um, well, at some point we, we started advocating Nutri-Score um, in the Netherlands. And how we did it, we, we started very simple as a consumer organization. We started looking at the supermarket shelves and how people choose their products. And I'd like to take, uh, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to take you briefly through uh, some of the, the work we have done. And then I'll, I'll finalize by uh, telling about the situation now in the Netherlands. Um, so let's start at, uh, at the drink section, how to choose an orange drink in the supermarkets. There's like the fizzy drinks, the orangey drinks, the orange juices, some more watery type of products. As a consumer, if you want to, to compare these products, like these seven products, you would all have to turn them around and, and look at the back. And it's a lot of work and you don't always have the time to do that. So that's, uh, as has been explained before, this can, Nutri-Score can make life a lot easier. So let's go to the next slide and we'll see the Nutri-Scores of those products. And we see um, that there's Bs, there's Ds, there's Cs, there's 
there's almost all of them, except for the A, that's only for water because, well, as you know, water is the, the most healthy drink, um, but it gives a good, uh, good impression of the, the healthiness of the different orange uh, drinks. And it not only works for drinks, we recently did a project on vegetarian meaty alternatives, like we see on the, on the right hand side. This is a kind of vegetarian spread and it's, it's interesting because consumers, they don't have like a history with this type of product, so they don't know is it a healthy choice or not, and this is an alternative for a product called filet américain, and we found like products that has had an A, so it's a, quite a good, uh, good score, and, and we had a, a C, so for this type of products, you can, you can try uh, something new. And also interesting to know is that the, the original meat uh, filet américain gets, normally gets around D. So these two products are, well, have a, a better nutri score. It's also interesting for, for consumers to know. And on the, on the right uh, uh, lower side of the slide, we'll see uh, again some, some breakfast products, this time from the Netherlands. And, the, the Eat Natural is, we, we looked at, at the, the breakfast cereal section with, with consumers and especially products from uh, like Eat Natural, it, it surprised a lot of consumers that this product didn't get an A or a B because it's, it has such a, a, shiny, a shiny look. It, it says breakfast with benefits and, and all those kind of claims. And uh, well, actually the, there was a lot of surprise and a lot of consumers uh, told us that they, they were very happy to, to know a bit more about the healthiness because especially with this type of products, people, yeah, they find it very difficult to judge how healthy it is. And next slide, please. This is um, um, one, of the, one of the charts we made of, of 50 uh, snacks. And this was also something that a lot of consumers valued. Of course, they know a healthy snack is, is a fruit, so they, they know that the, the best thing to do is, is to eat a banana or an apple and not too much snacks. But of course, sometimes you, as a consumer, you, you want to have something else and um, what are healthy options. Mm, and I'd like to share you one of my personal surprises. As a, as a food researcher, I've come across many products, but, and I was not, uh, I was, in general, I was quite, uh, it, was, it was all according to what we were expecting, except for one in the E section. It's a kind of rice cake. It's, it's called a yogurt rice cake. And it came out with E. And we, we were checking the, the calculation because we calculated the Nutri scores and we, we expected it to be, to be a mistake. But in the end, it turned out this, this yogurt rice cake isn't actually just yogurt and rice cake, but there's a like a substance which is a bit like chocolate, white chocolate on it. And it's actually quite, uh, well, there's quite a lot of saturated fat, a lot of sugar. So the E was totally uh, as it should have been. So that's what, uh, what we learned about it. And it's a, it's a chart that's been shared a lot on, on social media as well, because people just want to know um, how healthy their, uh, their snacks are. Uh, next slide, please. Also, I'd like to, to share, um, with you how Dutch consumers feel about Nutri-Score. It hasn't yet been uh, officially approved in the Netherlands, but uh, it's gaining um, some, some knowledge. And, and we asked a representative panel of Dutch consumers about their attitude. And, and we saw that a lot of consumers around three quarters is, is very positive or positive about, uh, about Nutri-Score. And there's not a, few, not a lot of people that are, are negative about it. And that means that we're, we're very happy um, with uh, the decision of the, the Dutch government to introduce Nutri-Score next year after the, the scientific uh, review. Thank you. Thanks very much. I mean, it's interesting to see also how the take up in the Netherlands has taken place and how that contrasts or, or is similar to what's happening in France. Let's turn now to Italy. Let's go to Franco Braga from Ultra Consumo. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the, this color coding labeling system has been controversial in Italy. Franco, tell us about the situation there. Thanks, Dave. Uh, I wish to start my speech uh, uh, with a necessary, necessary premise. 
I will report the point uh, of view and the position of alto consumer. Uh, the largest and the more representative Italian Consumer Association, member of BEUT since uh, 1978, uh, but I'm not the uh, spokesperson for all the Italian Consumer Association. And certainly, I'm not a reference of the Italian position. Okay, this is clear, we can go on. I speak for Alto Consumer. Next slide. Uh, I will, uh, the next, thanks. Uh, I will briefly illustrate the Italian landscape and the major criticism leveled at the Mutri score in our country. You see in the picture is a, uh, a newspaper headline uh, is just an example, uh, one of many, but uh, uh, I think it's emblematic. I can translate, uh, because of course it's in Italian, another secret today reading, um, Europe also attacked us on food. This is uh, the tone usually in the paper in Italy. In Italy, the whole debate about the front of fact was unbalanced because focused more on commercial issues rather than on public health. And especially the Nutri-Score system was the subject of a biased communication that uh, we can say really demonized it even before consumers knew it. And in our opinion, the new Italian proposal, the Nutri-Inform Bachelor, share the same weakness of a standard nutritional table. But I will explain later in another slide. The next one, please. Okay, the opinion of ultra-consumo uh, on Nutri-Score. Uh, we believe that that is uh, uh, essential uh, to have one point clear. I mean, the front of pack nutritional labeling doesn't aim to make a list of good and bad food, but to, to give consumer simply a recommendation to limit their intake of what contains too much salt, too much fat, too much sugar. And we think that the Nutri-Score, thanks to its mix of color code and bold legend, it is an effective and practical tool, easy to understand. Easier to understand the nutritional table in tiny forms on the back. This is our position, but as we heard, is a, a position supported by many consistent scientific studies. The next one. I want to talk about uh, uh, the two main criticism uh, level that uh, Nutri-Score in Italy. The first one, Nutri-Score is against the Mediterranean, Mediterranean diet. Well, clearly untrue. And we can have a look at the picture. It's very, very clear. We know Mediterranean diet is characterized by an abundant consumption of fluid, legume, vegetable, cereal. We can see this kind of food at the base of the pyramid of the Mediterranean diet. And you see immediately that the Nutri-Score in this case is A, a good evaluation. After the, the pyramid usually include a moderate intake of fish, we are in the middle of the pyramid, a low intake of meat and dairy products, and very low intake of cured meat and very, very low intake of uh, sweety, fatty, and salty foods. And if we look at the Nutri-Score, in this case, at the top of the pyramid, we see that the Nutri-Score, in, in this case, became D, E. So there is a clear coherence between the pyramid of Mediterranean diet and the Nutri-Score evaluation. So it's very, very clear. The next one. The second main criticism uh, of uh, Nutri-Score in our country. Nutri-Score is against the Made in Italy. Another time, 
clearly untrue. Not true that Nutriscor penalize Italian products. Uh, by their nature, many cheeses and cured meats are in the orange or red zone of Nutriscor. This means that they should be consumed in moderation. Uh, and this is true for many gastronomic excellence from Quadra, French cheese, Spanish ham, English bacon, and go on, pecorino, parmesan, excellent food, but uh, nutritional, very rich. So the point, the important point is that the gastronomic quality of a product should not be confused with its nutritional quality. This is the point. And the next one, please. Okay. Uh, the nutri informed button, the new proposal uh, of uh, Italy as uh, uh, front of back uh, lemon. Uh, we think, you see in the picture, uh, we think that is a rather complex proposal. Not effective in consumer understanding, not easy to interpret it and which has been designed without a real involvement of consumer representatives. A real involvement. You are informed, not involved. Why we think it is not a so good uh, proposal? It doesn't use color content. It mimics the nutritional table without adding elements that make easier for consumer understanding of the information given. And the battery, the battery symbol, because you see there is a, a battery to indicate the percentage um, in, the, in, the, in the symbol, but the battery symbol risk to be misleading. Why? Because in the common perception, the more the battery is charged, the better. But in this case, exactly it is the opposite. A real misleading and not easy to understand. And another point that we criticize the producers are free to put the nutri form battery only on the product they select and not on the wall or their reference. I mean, to be clear, if there is a producer of cookies with a dozen of uh, different cookies. Uh, he can choose two or, um, that are particularly healthy and put the Nutri-Score only on these two. This is not correct, and this is also misleading. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, let's turn to Germany now. Germany has endorsed and notified the Nutri-Score system to the European Commission. Uh, so let's turn to Anne Markwart from VZBV uh, from Germany to hear about the situation there. Yes, thank you very much for um, letting me tell you about the German path to Nutri-Score. Um, could I see, or could we see my presentation? Wonderful, thank you very much. Okay, so to the first slide. So next slide, please. How did it happen in two, it's coming. Next slide, please. Okay, I can't see my presentation, can you? We, we can't see it either. I think it's coming back now. <laughs> okay. Here it is, okay. Great, okay, next one, please. Wonderful, thank you. So how did it happen? In 2018, um, the Conservative and the Labour Party agree in their um, coalition treaty to develop an easier to understand simplified front of pack labelling scheme as the coalition treaty you see here <laughs> next to the 2018. Um, and in 2019, while um, a few food companies say they would like to use Nutri-Score in Germany, most food industry trade groups and lobby groups reject a color-coded model as they have done for many years in the past. 
And the biggest food industry lobby group, the Lebensmittelverband, develops its own model, which in appearance leans a bit on the GDA model using these pie charts that you see here in the first picture. Uh, and daily allowances of different nutrients, although it doesn't, uh, uh, it's not based on portions, but on 100 grams. And um, so they publish that, and the consumer and the health groups mainly, or Unisono support Nutri-Score. What happens then? The Conservative Minister for Food and Agriculture, Julia Klöckner, which you see in the very right picture here as well, um, has her federal food research institutes called the MRA, um, Max Rubner Institute to produce a comparison. So like a report, a study of existing front of pack nutrient labeling schemes. And the Institute finds that an overall rating um, of the food uh, helps consumers best and that traffic light color coding works very well for consumers. They also say no system is ever perfect. Um, We've heard that um, before from Professor Rayner, for example, as well. But the Institute is then commissioned to develop a new model, nevertheless, and it does. And they, won, uh, they come up with this, the second one you see here, um, and it works with color coding, but not with traffic light color coding. Um, next thing um, happening is that the government engages food industry groups as well as consumer and health groups, and then decides um, that a scientific consumer survey should be conducted uh, to test these different models. So the one developed by the food industry, the one developed by the research institute, the Nutri-Score, and the Nordic Keyhole system, because it has been part of the debate for such a long time. And the government argued as well, European law required them anyway to test any labeling scheme uh, with consumers before introducing it. So um, in this survey, Nutri-Score performs best and was then officially or is officially introduced. Uh, it was just last week. It's the last photo you see here in the middle. It's the minister on uh, the right. It's Klaus Müller, the head of our organization. And on the left is the head of the food um, trade group. So next slide, please. I want to tell you just a little bit. This is a very text heavy slide, as you can see, about what the study did and how it was conducted. Um, it was a combination of focus group discussions to figure out how to best approach consumer attitudes and um, their understanding of nutrient labeling in Germany, and a representative quantitative study with 1600 consumers. And um, the consumers were asked what they would find important in front of pack labeling, how useful they find different parameters like listing infos on the single nutrients or the overall score, what would be helpful for them to compare products and so on and so forth. And all these parameters were then tested on the different models. And they were also shown pictures of pizza boxes with the different labels and they were asked which one most likely could contribute to a healthy diet. So which one was the best among the ones shown. And Nutri-School was the system that helped the largest number of consumers get that right, the pizza exercise, so 70%, followed by the model developed by the Research Institute, 60%. Then came the keyhole system, 41%, and then the food lobby system that uh, helped only 21% of the consumers to identify the, the best of these pizza boxes from a nutritional point of view. So Nutri-Score also came out as a very clear favorite in preference as well, followed by the Research Institute model, the keyhole, and last came the food industry model. Uh, interesting um, might be that the groups Nutri-Score performed best in and um, the people that found it most helpful were older consumers, consumers with a lower degree of education and people with a BMI over 30. And uh, based on this study, and I would argue probably as well supported, of course, by the existing body of research from other countries, um, the German government then decided to implement Nutri-Score. Next slide, please. So as a conclusion, I would say it was the, absolutely the right decision to test these different models with German consumers because the consumers are the ones who have to understand it, have to use it. And it was also the right thing to engage not only food industry in this dialogue, but of course, consumer groups and health groups as well and involve them in this process. And we were involved in the process. 
And it's also very important that the government has been very transparent about this study. So they published all the details, all the results. You can all see that online. So there was no accusation of twitching and twisting the questions or the answers or whatever. And um, yeah, now Nutri-Score has been um, implemented in Germany and that's very, very good news for consumers. Even better news, of course, would be if this would be a, a mandatory um, label and that can only be done on uh, the European level. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot, Anne. So you guys have asked, been asking tons of very interesting questions online. Unfortunately, we are running short on time, so we won't be able to take very many of them, I'm afraid. But uh, just a reminder, someone from Bayouk is also going to be answering questions in the Q&A itself. Um, most of the questions have been from Mike. So Mike, I've grouped four questions together here for you. And then I have one question for the rest of the panelists. So um, Stephen Peters from the Dutch Dairy Association asks you, Mike, uh, he notes that uh, it predicts a four point 5% change, that's under 5%. Uh, is that really very uh, significant um, when you're looking at uh, that change in healthy food choices? Paolo Di Stefano from Coldoretti asks, do you really think that a simplistic color choice can actually lead to a healthier choice? Is the system, is the Nutrisource system too simplistic? Uh, then we had a bunch of questions about olive oil. This has been a a uh, controversial element in Italy. Um, does this scoring system, Mike, uh, disadvantage olive oil? And finally, there was also a bunch of questions uh, about portion sizes. Um, uh, why is Nutri-Score not based on portion sizes? Uh, and what's the best approach there? So Mike, if you could answer those four questions from the audience. Okay, the, firstly, the small change, the 4.5% change. That's a huge change, actually. If you measure the effect across the whole population, that would that turns into a big health effect. Um, it's a small change in purchases, yes. And of course, we need to do other things besides improve the labeling, but still it's a it's a big change. And also I think um, we mustn't underestimate the effect of labeling systems on the producers, you mean because we, we now know that a lot of manufacturers, retailers have reformulated their products to get better Nutri-Score labeling. So uh, a better labeling under Nutri-Score. So that's an, also an important uh, impact, if you like, of the label. In terms of color coding, I think obviously there's lots of ways of interpreting the information, the nutrition information, batteries, stars, color coding. But I think, um, universally or almost universally all the studies show that color coding does a lot better than stars or battery um, levels or, or or anything else even words so i think color coding is an important way element of the front about labeling olive oil yes um the nutri score algorithm does take account of different categories there are four categories um for which the scoring is slightly different under nutri score cheeses oils and fats, all other foods and drinks. A good nutrient profiling model does need to take some account of the categories. And I think Nutri-Score takes sufficient account of the different types of uh, different levels of saturated fat and polyunsaturated fats in different oils. And finally, on portion sizes, yes, it is true that Nutri-Score does is a per hundred gram system, not a per portion size system. I think um, there are arguments for incorporating portion sizes into um, nutrient profiling models and food labeling systems. But basically, I think it's much simpler if it's based on a per 100 gram system rather than a poor portion system. It, um, lots of foods don't come in standard for portions, particularly um, things like milk and cheese and so forth. Um, all these have very variable portions. I think it's much simpler if your labeling system is based on per 100 grams. Great, thanks for that. Uh, now I'm gonna kind of synthesize a bunch of the questions into one question for each of the consumer group panelists, uh, which is the, the central question here. Do you think that a food labeling scheme like this should be mandatory or should it be voluntary? Olivier, what's your take, mandatory or voluntary? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, of course it should be mandatory because uh, we see in France that uh, Nutri-Score is mainly present on those food products that get a Nutri-Score A or B. 
and we very seldom see neutral score C or D, and we never see neutral score E on a voluntary basis. And since this information is paramount for neutral score, and they want to, for consumers because they want to, to have a balanced diet, so it's necessary to make it compulsory. Nelika, what do you think? Yes, it should definitely be mandatory. Uh, in that way, it can have the biggest impact and it's especially necessary if we, we look to the current situation regarding overweight and obesity. We don't have the time to wait for, for a voluntary uptake of, uh, of the front of fact label. Frank, uh, what do you think is, 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 what's your take from the Italian perspective? I think it has to be mandatory. I have no doubt it's uh, the only way that to be effective. And As Anne? I already explained very well. And Anne, what's your take? Absolutely, it has to be mandatory. Okay, I think some pretty clear consensus on that. Now, whenever we're talking about EU legislation and this mandatory and voluntary question, you tend to get very different answers from business organizations than you do from consumer groups and environmental groups. So let's turn now next to our panel of business uh, representatives to hear about their take on the private sector's view on this tool. Uh, first, let's hear from Katrien van Biesen. Uh, she is health and nutrition manager at the Belgian retailer Delez, which has begun to use Nutriscore on its own branded products. Katrien? Katrien, are you there? We may have lost Katrien, so let's uh, instead go first to, uh, wait, yes, Katrien, are you there? I'm there, can you hear okay. me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, um, I will uh, briefly present you how we did in uh, the Les of Belgium. So can you please uh, show the slides? I will stop my video to uh, better enhance the sound. So, uh, next slide, please. So, um, Deleuze is a retailer in Belgium that has a that had put uh, health as a strategic uh, element in, in our uh, strategy. And as you can see on, on the picture, um, we had before, between 2012 and 2017, we had the Deleuze Extra logo uh, on our uh, products, but these were based on the choices criteria and we only addressed the best in class products. And so you see the question mark, what to do about all these other products, uh, how to inform better our consumers about that. Next slide, please. So uh, early 2018, we asked our um, customers by focus groups to um, analyze or to test actually um, color coded traffic lights against Nutri-Score. And here you can see the outcome um, where really Nutri-Score came out as the winner and where traffic lights was rather de described as for dietitians, too much detail, too difficult, etc. So it was already clear for us beginning of um, 2018 to go for uh, Nutri-Score. Next slide, please. So uh, let me show you the big milestones we did. In August 2018, we were the first retailer in Belgium to launch this Nutri-Scores on, um, on our packs of private label. And we started with the categories like previously mentioned, the most difficult for consumers like breakfast cereals, yogurts, desserts, and also um, prepared meals. In the meantime, we've done uh, more than 4,000 products on pack and more than 12,000 uh, products are available via our digital and uh, shelf labels. So you see there in January, we did uh, everything uh, via our app, application of Deleuze, and also online on our eShop, all these codes, uh, Nutri-Scores were present. At the right-hand side, you see that as from May 2019, we provided the Nutri-Scores as well on the shelf labels. So we have electronic price shelf labels, and there we also put it, the scores, Nutri-Scores on it. Here, due to technical elements, it was only in black and white. We would like to move in the future to color-coded, but at this moment, it wasn't yet 
possible. So even when all the packs were not done yet, uh, the customers in our source could uh, find the Nutri-Score next to the price information. Next slide, please. Uh, as previously mentioned, in the meantime, indeed, we did several uh, reformulations. And here you can see some uh, of the examples. And we also inform our customers on our website about these reformulations. Next slide, please. Um, in August 2019, we already celebrated the one year of uh, existence of Nutri-Score in our uh, stores. And we, we did have the biggest online assortment of A and B products in the Belgian retail supermarkets. So, with, so then we continued with the red wire of um, Nutri-Score in all our commercial uh, actions as well. So we did uh, back to school actions where we gave several promotions to Nutri-Score A and B products. Next slide, please. So we did that at frequent basis at several moments in, in the years to give really rebates on these uh, more healthy products A and B. Next slide, please. And as very recently, uh, beginning of uh, October this year, we also did the last mile and we integrated Nutri-Score in our new loyalty approach. I will show you in the next slide how it works. So actually, when you download this app of this new uh, loyalty card, people who um, subscribe to this kind of profile, they can get up to 30 euros reduction discounts on all A and B products in a month. So how does it work? They look at your basket um, shopped in the last month. And depending on what you were, um, you were buying last month, it's either 5, 10 or 15% of rebate on the a and B products. So we really want to boost um, the stimulants um, by price reductions. For those who want to eat healthy, we can uh, give them an extra uh, stimulus. Next slide, please. And on top of that, we also give insights via the application in your own consumption pattern. So you can see the proportion of how many products you bought within the A, B, C, D or E categories. And then if you click, for instance, on the D uh, products you bought, they will also give you through the app a uh, personalized recommendation for another product that is comparable in the same category with a better Nutri-Score. So there, um, I wanted to show you that we really tried not only to, to launch this uh, Nutri-Score system on pack, but really integrated it in our commercial uh, approaches and even in our digital and loyalty uh, approach. So, um, in my opinion, uh, we really can um, go even further with that. Uh, but time's up, I think. So that's what I wanted to show you. If you're inter interested, I uh, added also the uh, website where you can, fi can find more information on how we did in the last Belgium. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Katrien. Uh, I'm Adela Schopper, so actually that's very interesting to me, this loyalty uh, program. I'm going to keep that in mind for okay. sure. Um, so let's next turn to Bart uh, van de Vetere. He's from Nestle, so he's going to tell us a little bit about that perspective of the value chain uh, and to what extent uh, Nestle has been incorporating the Nutri-Score system. Bart? Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Dave and, and everybody on the call. Um, so maybe just first giving my perspective on, on Nutri-Score. Uh, what, what I believe is that Nutri-Score and what we as a company are doing on nutrition and health, these are kind of two parts, two sides of the same coin. Huh? Uh, we want, as Monique said, we want to have the healthiest choice in each product category where we are active and Nutri-Score gives us a standard for that, a reference, a benchmark for that. And, and on top, not only helping us as a company to evolve, but also translating this in an understandable way to consumers and, and the research has been shown earlier on, so I will not repeat that. So Nutri-Score is all about healthier choices um, and it allows people to compare within a category. Olivier was referring to breakfast cereals. I have also a couple of uh, examples later on uh, 
uh, on this. Huh? Um, so we are implementing it everywhere. And, and I have here an example of a chocolate with an E. Uh, we are putting the E's already uh, as we do the A, B, C, D's as well. Um, and we want to give Nutri-Score scale. Um, and you see that on the next slide. Um, as Nestle, we have uh, started to implement it already in eight countries where we can. Huh? Uh, um, and we, we would be ready to go beyond. Huh? And uh, so if some of the organizations here on the call would be willing to help to go to the government to help to convince, we are, uh, please uh, write to me. Um, you see also some of the examples that we have there already on the shelves. There should be 7,500 by mid-2022 in those eight uh, countries. Then I will tell you two things about our reformulation and innovation journey. Um, we started, and that's on the next slide, we started with that some 20 years ago. And um, Nutri-Score gives now an extra in, in, incentive ultimately to go and to move faster. Um, you see here uh, plant-based uh, products from, uh, from our site. For now, really, we have renovated 25% of this veggie segment, I will call it, uh, based on, on Nutri-Score. Here in this case, you see this uh, Carré Toscan, and, and thanks God and, and the European Parliament, we can still call it a Carré. Uh, and they have been reformulated to become an A over the last months. But you see it as well on the pizza range, for example. Here, uh, we have really the plan to move half of our pizzas of Buitoni to a B scoring in France by the end of next year. So you really see examples of our business people saying to, uh, to our innovators and our researchers, please help us, I want to get there. And they, they put uh, in internal standards to move the needle. Huh? And on slide, uh, the next slide, you can see actually what, what Olivier somehow already mentioned, uh, Nesquik, huh? uh, good example. We started to reformulate in 2003. At that time, if Nutri-Score would have existed, Nesquik would have got a D. Today, we are with Nesquik in the market uh, with a B. Huh? So, uh, and I can tell you that our breakfast cereal company uh, has basically decided that um, we should go half of the Nestle breakfast cereals in France should be A or B by the end of next year. And, and just for a comparison, there were 16% A or B uh, last year. So, so I think that is a massive change and, and Nutri-Score certainly has helped. Obviously we would have evolved, but probably not in, with that speed if we couldn't uh, communicate that clearly also to the consumers. And also it has driven us to bring new products to the markets, innovations from scratch. You see the NAT example there. Uh, probably without Nutri-Score, it would have a different uh, composition than it has today. And, and, and I can say that today it's probably healthier than we would have brought it to the market. And that's what Nutri-Score is bringing. I think it's a real incentive for companies uh, to reformulate, to develop new products. And on the next slide, you can see my final call, basically. If we make Nutri-Score mandatory, and like for the previous speakers, mandatory is the answer, also from my side, we can compete on the health of products, but we can also give consumers access to the healthiest choices all over Europe. And that is what we want to be part of and uh, happy to help and happy to be part of this uh, debate today. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Sorry, I had to find my mute button there. Uh, so now let's get the regulatory perspective from the European Commission. Uh, now I'd like to turn the floor over to Sabine Pelzer. She's from the European Commission's Health Department. Sabine? Uh, Sabine, are you there? Uh, checking again for Sabine. Okay, no. Let's take some questions. Uh, yes, I heard something. Hello. Hi, Sabine. 
yeah. okay. Hi, hi, hi. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'm so, so thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, I'm just sorry that I could only join uh, this interesting conference now. Uh, I was uh, discussing with the member states on the council conclusion on, on front of PAC. So you could imagine that it was an extremely interesting uh, discussion and uh, it was much longer than expected. So that's why I could only uh, connect myself uh, 10 minutes ago. So I have heard um, the, the last presentation of, uh, of Nestle and just a part of the one from, uh, from Deleuze. So extremely interesting uh, presentations. So uh, from my side, I have five minutes, so it will be uh, very short. I would like to give you an update on the next steps uh, concerning the initiative which has been announced by the Commission in the Farm to Fork strategy. So um, you know that the, the Farm to Fork strategy was adopted in May of this year under the Green Deal, uh, under the Green Deal of this new Commission. And this Farm to Fork strategy um, presents the number of, of the initiatives that the Commission would like to propose in a quite short time. And one of these initiatives is to propose a mandatory harmonized uh, front of pack labeling uh, with a, a, a timeline which is extremely short uh, because the Commission is supposed to, pre to present a legislative proposal by end of next year not next year, 2022, I'm already, I'm already in 2021, no. So by end of 2022, which gives uh, the commission two years. So, um, and the commission, I just would like to, uh, to highlight a few points that the commission made this choice uh, because uh, it considered it extremely important to empower consumers to have more information and to allow them to make uh, healthy uh, choices. And uh, it has been recognized as well that um, providing more information to the consumer is extremely powerful to also uh, reorient, um, let's say, or, or um, incentivize uh, the food industry to produce food which are which are more more, more which are sustainable or more sustainable or more healthy. So um, the, co the colleague from Nestle just said, and uh, I think this is completely right, that when you can communicate to the consumer positive aspect of your, of your food, uh, then uh, you are incentivized to reformulate uh, your food to ensure that uh, this is your food which is selected and not another one, which is a less positive, uh, let's say, um, nutrition pro nutritional profile. So to come back to the Commission initiative, um, as it was announced, uh, the Commission will launch an impact assessment in the coming weeks. So it means that we are currently working on the inception impact assessment, which is, let's say, the roadmap explaining, let's say, the, the main outlines of uh, the impact assessment that we will launch on front of pack uh, labeling. Uh, just to give you a few uh, elements on what will be present in uh, this inception impact assessment. So we will describe mainly the problems that the initiative aim to tackle. We will describe the objectives to be met and why EU action is, uh, is considered as necessary. And this document will also outline the different policy options that will be considered um, under this initiative of, um, of an harmonized uh, front of pack uh, labeling. And then we will also describe uh, the main element of the, of the consultation strategy uh, itself. So um, with the publication of this document, um, we will launch um, a, pub uh, a public consultation where all stakeholders, but also member states and also the public, if they want to, they can, uh, let's say, uh, see what the Commission has in mind and they can comment. And it ex it's an extremely uh, important step, let's say, uh, in the development of a legislative proposal, because from the start, uh, the stakeholders and the, the member states, they can intervene and they can give them, let's say, the blessing or not on the on the direction the commission would like to take uh, in this context so as i said this inception impact assessment should be published uh, before the end of the year and then uh, after that we will revise if necessary of course um, the let's say the, the the direction we want to to follow and then we have in mind to uh, launch the, the real let's say impact assessment and to um, ask an external contractor to um, to make a study uh, an impact assessment study on the different options. Uh, 
So I can already tell you today that what we have in mind, it is to, uh, let's say, really make an evaluation of the impact of the existing scheme, which have been developed up, up until now uh, in Europe. Uh, you know that there are different types of scheme, evaluative, non-evaluative, uh, color coded or not. So we really want to have, let's say, evidence um, when we will take the, the decision from the Commission side. Then in parallel to this uh, impact assessment, we will um, go back to EFSA. Uh, we will go back to EFSA on the question of the nutrient profiling. Um, to get some, let's say, up-to-date uh, opinion and advices from, from EFSA. Um, we plan to have a, a mandate which is quite general uh, on the approach of nutrient profiling, on the choice of nutrients should, that should be part in a nutrient profiling model on the food category. So it's, it's a mandate which is quite general, but which should help the Commission um, to, to take a choice later on in addition of the result of the inception, inception in the impact assessment. Then we also plan in the context of the front of pack to go back to the GRC. So you know that the Commission uh, has adopted, uh, adopted a report, the report on front of pack, at the same time as the farm to fork strategy. This report was based on a literature review from the Joint Research Center. We would like now to ask for an update on this literature review because we want to be sure we have, let's say, um, information and elements which are up to date uh, the day we uh, make a proposal, the day we make a legislative proposal. So that's why we are conducting all those, let's say, um, steps in parallel um, to be able to, to, to fulfill with the, with the commitment which was made uh, to make a legislative proposal by end of 2022. So um, at this stage, of course, the Commission has made no choice on which, uh, which scheme should be the one to be proposed. Um, we, we, we are trying really to collect um, the maximum of evidence to support the choice we will make in the future. Um, you know as well that the discussion are not easy. Um, I mean that the subject is extremely polarized. And this is the reason why we have to really gather all uh, evidence uh, and objective evidence uh, to support the proposal uh, that will be made. Um, yes, so um, I think at this stage, that's, that's the only stuff I wanted to uh, share with you. I'm happy to reply to some questions and to, to be part of the, of the debate, if we can say it like that, uh, taking place just, just now. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sabine. Yes, as you mentioned, uh, contentious issues. So there's a lot of stakeholder consultation going on on the subject. Uh, and we'll see more of that, I'm sure, over the coming months. Uh, so you guys have had some questions for this round of panelists coming in via the Q&A. We have a question here from Luciano Stella uh, from Must and Partners. Uh, it's for Catrian. Uh, he says that one of your slides, Catrian, showed some ham. How did you reformulate that to improve the score? Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, the ham in particular, it was um, about the salt content. So uh, there, uh, there was an addition in, in terms of uh, sodium uh, that, we, that we made with that supplier. Yeah. OK, we have another similar question from Mr. Stella to Nestle. Um, how did you reformulate pizza? How do you get a better score with a pizza product uh, and also a similar question, do you hope to, imp does Nestle hope to implement the Nutri-Score system in Greece? It wasn't colored in on your map there. Yep, Th thank you um, for those questions. So for the pizza question, it's rather straightforward. It has to do with um, saturated fats and salt uh, uh, that you can uh, reduce. So that's how we came to the better score. For example, saturated fats were reduced by 28%. I'm just to give you a view how we got from the uh, uh, the D to the C already with the four cheeses example. Um, then on Greece, obviously, as I said, um, we go with the with the local governments at this stage in absence of uh, an EU uh, legislation, mandatory EU legislation. So we are um, discussing with with uh, the governments and where. Uh, 
uh, we feel uh, there is alignment on that and the government also wants to uh, communicate because we need to we need to do this all together Let, let's face it um, just putting uh, Nutri-Score there, but the government says something else or is not communicating about it. Academics are doing different things. This does not necessarily help. Huh? Then it's very one-sided. So I think we are we are really looking for uh, all allies in each and every country uh, to uh, to do these things together in the right and proper way. And of course, the European framework would would help that. Um, so that's, uh, I think, important. And maybe there is one thing I also wanted to add a question there on um, does, does it advantage big companies versus small companies? Uh, look, also for us, sometimes Nutri-Score, uh, even if we want to, for example, the chocolate I have here, if we would reduce uh, uh, and still would like to call it chocolate, would not be possible to, to get a better score. So we, we are in the same boat than small companies. Sometimes it doesn't work, but sometimes we also need to accept that maybe the chocolate, uh, we need to consume it in the right portion, in the right frequency. And yeah, it's an E. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's what matters, giving transparency to, uh, to consumers. Yes, Sabine, I saw that question as well uh, from an anonymous questioner. It's about whether or not larger companies are going to have an, a leg up here because they're more equipped to be able to convert to a new labeling scheme in a short amount of time. So let me put that question to you as well. And then there's also a related question. Uh, questioner asks, um, you know, before the end of 2022, it, from a, a lead time perspective, that's not all that far away. Um, so how can the European Commission help business operators to develop and implement Nutri-Score in the meantime and be ready for that change date. And also while you're answering that question, one more timeline question from someone here. They want to know when will the consultation be published? Okay, thank you very much. Um, for the first questions uh, regarding, you know, uh, big companies versus uh, SMEs, you have to know that in the impact assessment that we have to conduct and in line with the better regulation principles that have been adopted by the Commission a few years ago, we have to, uh, in particular, look at the possible impact of this new legislative proposal on SMEs. So we have to look on the impact. So let, let, uh, let be clear, the costs uh, of such a change, but not only the cost, also the, the other possible burdens that uh, can, uh, can, can impact from this, uh, this proposal. So on all food business operators, but in particular on SMEs, because any new legislative proposal should be at the lower, let's say, cost to food business operators and in particular to SMEs. So this is one of the points that we have to assess. We have to calculate the impact or evaluate the impact in uh, this impact assessment uh, study. So uh, this is clear that that's one aspect which has to be taken into account and we have to also to take into account the feasibility aspect. So um, you, I, I can reassure uh, the, the, the SMEs and the, and the person asking this question that it's fully taken into account before deciding um, on, um, on any, any, any way forward. Um, in addition, um, you have to know as well that some member states, uh, in the context of those discussions, they are asking uh, uh, the Commission and also asking themselves how uh, we could help and support the SMEs when a scheme will be decided and if a scheme is decided to be harmonized at EU level. So all these elements are really taken into account uh, in, the, in the context of the, of, the, of the discussion now and in the context of a possible uh, de uh, decision later on. Then you ask me about um, the inception impact assessment. So I said that uh, it should be published in the coming weeks. We thought that it could be published in November. Uh, it might be a little bit delayed, but before the end of the year, this document will be published uh, on the better regulation portal. It means that it's accessible to all. Uh, to stakeholders, to the public, it's a, it's a transparent place to, to be able to consult the document, to make comments. So you have a specific portal where you can provide your comments and of course you have a deadline, it's a, a one month cons consultation. Um, it's open to all, uh, it's transparent and then uh, the commission after that, uh, after the one month of course has to close the consultation and take into account uh, those, those comments. Then there was a third question and I forgot what it was, I'm sorry. Uh, the three questions were the uh, whether it disadvantages small retailers, whether yes. you guys are going to prepare companies for the change in 2022. 
Ah, yes. So um, that's a good question, but it's extremely difficult for me to reply. Why? Because, as I said, in the impact assessment, we are going to assess different types of scheme. So uh, meaning that at this stage, we have not made any choice. And it is difficult at this stage to already put in place some, let's say, technical support or some tools to help um, the food business operators to already be prepared uh, to the future. Uh, why? Because um, as we don't know uh, yet which scheme will be selected, and maybe it could be one of the existing ones with some adaptation as well. So everything is still open and possible. So it is a bit difficult at this stage to, um, to, to provide, let's say, concrete tools uh, to the food business operators. The thing that we want to uh, do and that we have done up until now, it's to be very transparent and very vocative to say, please be prepared because we have in mind to propose something by 2022. Of course, after that, you would still need to have the, the, the dialogue with the council and the parliament. So it will take some time to have an agreed, an agreed scheme at EU level. And I suppose as well that we will have a transitional period because it will be a big, a big change for the food business operators. So at this stage now, it is difficult to already you know, um, provide some, some concrete tools to food business operators. We would just want them to, to, to know that they have to be prepared. They have also to look around and see what's what's going on on the EU market um, and and uh, yes and and try to try to 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 evolve but we we cannot provide at this stage concrete uh, concrete element and concrete tools um, sorry for that but uh, it's a bit too early Thanks. So we have a last question here for Bart from Nestle. Um, so Ava Harrimans from Ghent University raised a question to you uh, because a couple of years ago, Nestle supported the portion-based evolved nutrition label. What convinced you to instead move towards Nutriscore? Honestly, um, I, I mentioned it before, we are all together in this. Huh? And there was, uh, so it means retail, manufacturers, consumer organizations, governments, academics, and so on. Um, and if we cannot find sufficient backing or consensus around the system that at that time we wanted to develop, which was uh, like the UK traffic lights with portions, it didn't work. There was no sufficient support for that. Uh, but at the same time, we wanted to help the consumer. And then we, we reverted to Nutri-Score because we felt that was the right thing. It was backed broadly in, in a lot of countries already. And we, we jumped on that and we want to help the, the consumer. That's, that's basically what convinced us. Makes sense. Well, I want to thank all of the panelists for some really interesting presentations and the discussion there. I mean, I, I certainly learned a lot about this system. You know, as Sabine mentioned, this is going to be a live issue in EU policymaking over the coming months. Uh, this is a decision that uh, policymakers are going to have to take combined with national governments and members of the European Parliament. Uh, so there is a lot of discussion, I'm sure, to be coming on this issue. But I think this has been a great uh, jumping off point for people to really look at the different options on the table uh, and, and really understand what Nutri-Score is. So thank you so much to our panelists. Thanks to the audience for some great questions. Uh, and I wish you all a great evening. Thanks. Take care.